Hello, science enthusiasts. Brett Burkett here for Blackland Geology and Reptiles, continuing our study on climate change by talking about politics and misinformation. This is going to be an incredibly uh, word intensive presentation because since what we are dealing with is politics, since what we are dealing with is misinformation, I want to focus on several quotes that people have said. And in order to do that, I have to actually present the entire quote. So why politics and misinformation? Climate change is an incredibly contentious topic. Part of that is somehow because of all of the interactions with our society, because it has gotten politicized, it has now become one of those things that's on the laundry list of things that you can't discuss in pleasant company. When I was a kid, it was uh, politics, religion, and abortion. And now that laundry list is longer than I can even gesticulate on the screen. It seems like there's nothing that we can talk about aside from the weather. And because weather and climate are different, you can get away with that and not actually get in trouble by talking about climate change. But it usually comes up. So this lecture is talking about how climate change got so politicized, how so much misinformation was spread, and how some things are getting done. And what might need to happen, etc. Regardless of my own opinion in this, I'm trying to be as objective as possible because it does not help if you just have another talking head tell you this is what needs to be done. Oh, we're sinners, etc. That doesn't help. So I've been teaching for a lot of years and I have tried over the years to make sure that when I discuss climate change, I discuss it in a way that is as ob objective as possible. One semester I would have been teaching and a student came up to me after the semester is over. I'm in my office grading, the semester is over, finals are done. And he walks into my office and he says, so what's the answer? And I went, what, what, the answer to what? He goes, to climate change, what's the answer? Is everything bad or is everything? And I said, what do you think about what I presented? He goes, but, but like summarize it for me. What's your opinion? I said, hmm, not going to do that. I said, because I want you to think about it. He goes, okay. And he leaves. So that's the way that I'm going to attempt to present this. The first thing we're going to talk about, graphs. I mentioned it to you last time, and I said that we we're going to talk about it again, and there's a reason. So one of my favorite political cartoons is this one. Here's where the lying began. When we look at something like graphs, we run into a very interesting scenario that depending on how you color it, right, red versus blue, hot versus cold, uh, depending on how you label the axes, depending on how you even title it, depending on if there are any things like the averages. We talked about those last time. This is the climate average for a 30-year period. This is what present is. You can sway people by the use of graphs. So how does that apply to politics and misinformation? Well, because we live in an age where we can very quickly make graphs on programs that we generally have all access to, then it's very quickly able to take some, some data and throw it together and show it in a way that can lead to a particular uh, train of thought. We can, in a sense, rather than saying the data clearly shows, we can frame the data in a way that people go, hmm. We can also tie in things like the difference between two things which are correlated and two things which are causative. One causes the other, and those are completely different. Two things can be appear related, but be completely unrelated, as we'll see here in a minute. So why do I bring this up? Because graphs and the presentation of data, which are gra graphs just take a whole bunch of uh, technical data and are able to present them in an easy way, make it very easy to showcase something that people go, oh, and now it sticks in our head because we are visual creatures, so it sticks in our head. So that's one thing. We, I'm going to show you two egregious examples of, of lying with graphs and then one that talks about climate change, and you can then see how we can actually then uh, start confusing the issue. Then we're going to talk about uh, sort of the history of politicization and then where we've gone with it and eventually uh, where we are right now. So that seems like a lot, of a lot of hemming and hawing, but there's a reason for this. This is actually another one of my favorite graphs to show uh, how misinformation can easily be spread. This came out of a uh, newspaper back in the late 70s, I think it was. And 
if we look at this, I'm not going to say the data clearly shows. We're going to break it down. Income of doctors versus other professionals. So we're going to see how their income relates to other professionals. The source, the Council on Wage and Price Stability, and median net incomes. Median, a median is, if I have a bunch of data, it is the middle value of that data. It's not an average. That's adding up everything and dividing by that number, but it's the middle value. You probably hear the term median income or median home value. But now we have some interesting other things here. Notice we don't really have a labeled axes. We do at the bottom, obviously years, but we have office-based non-salaried physicians. So these are physicians that uh, don't get a set salary from some company and that they get it from seeing patients, et cetera, and so they get the money from there. And then male professional, technical, and kindred workers, okay? So these are, what they're just saying is everybody, other professionals, they've somehow lumped all the technical workers. Uh, this could be everything from plumbers and electricians to professional technical, this could be lawyers, okay? If you look at this, they have something else on here. Notice they aren't just two lines. They're heads. They're heads that look like doc doctors, the idea of a stethoscope and a tie. And then the doctor's heads, for some reason, are all black. And then the male professional, technical, and kindred workers, which is a mouthful in itself, are all black. Heads, bodies, and the bars below them. And then, of course, we have years from 1939 to 1976. If you look at the line, if we drew a line through all the heads of the doctors, which is a strange statement to say, we can see that the doctor's heads are all increasing from left to right. So the suggestion is there that the salary is increasing because we have a number that we presume is in dollars given the lowest, most, the lowest leftmost doctor. There's a dollar sign there. So by 1976, they were making uh, $63,000 a year compared to $3,300 a year in 1939. Whereas the kindred workers there, admittedly it's pixelated, went from about $1,800 to about $16,000. But here's the interesting thing. I've never seen a graph presented this way outside of this one, but it shows how you could present data. One, we have the visual association with uh, doctors. They have stethoscopes and business suits and ties, right? We see them head and shoulders literally above the male professional and kindred workers, right? There, we just see them as faceless because we don't know what job they do because it's not shown on the image. So now we go, this is clearly a doctor. This is clearly the unwashed masses behind them. This is everybody else, right? Below each doctor's head is a physical bar, which actually has a number, right? 8,000, uh, 8,744, 13,150, et cetera. But below the male professionals at the bottom, we don't see that bar. But look at the lowest axes. In this case, the only axes, uh, time. 1939, 1947, 1951, 55, 63, 65, and so on. The interesting thing is this first block has an eight-year gap, then a four-year gap, then a four-year gap, then an eight-year gap, then a two-year, two-year, three-year, two-year, one-year, 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 one-year. They screwed up the axes. It isn't just a, a it isn't a, a uniform change, like every five years we measured it again. And then when you look at something like this, right here between these first two doctor jumps, this is a $5,500 uh, a year increase. But if you go to the next one, this is 5,500-ish, actually it's less, it's about 4,500-ish uh, on the next one, but the gap in the first one is bigger than the gap in the second one. Shouldn't that be shifted up? And then the next one, we had a 3,000-year gap, and then a 9,000. So they're not on par. They're not sliding, plus the years at the bottom aren't that way. What it suggests in a very quick glance is that doctors have an ever-increasing salary and they're always going to be. The divergence between them and everybody else just keeps going up. You want to be a doctor. Okay? So what do we have there? We have a visual association. Oh, there's a problem. You don't want to be one of those. You want to be a doctor. Okay? Let's look at another one. I love this one on the top. Unrefined plant food consumption. So unrefined plant food. This is, we, we haven't taken it through processing. We haven't added a bunch of fillers, et cetera. 
versus the killer diseases, heart disease and cancer. So what we're seeing here, as it says at the bottom, uh, the red percentage of deaths from heart disease and cancer, the green percentage of calories from unrefined plant foods. So at the left-hand side, we have Hungary, where 90% of deaths from heart disease and cancer, I guess 90% of people die from heart disease and cancer in Hungary, but in Laos, only about 6% of people die from heart disease and cancer. Ah, but in Hungary, 10% of people eat they get their calories from unrefined plant foods. And in Laos, it is 91, 92%. They look almost mirror images of each other. As we eat more plant food, unrefined plant food, as more of our calories come from that, then obviously the incidence of heart disease and cancer drop. So if I just eat plants, no heart disease. That's the suggestion, right? And logically, the suggestion here would be that if I somehow was able to get all of my calories from plants, I should be able to then reduce my chance of dying by heart disease and cancer to essentially zero. Okay? We can see, for example, in the USA, we're almost 80%, and then the other 12%, they're almost, right? The other 12% of our calories come from unrefined plant foods, but nearly 80% of us die from heart disease and cancer. So this would be one, one of the things that I would talk about, correlation versus causation. Why? Well, they're implying there's a causative effect. The more unrefined plant foods that I eat, the less chance of heart disease and cancer. So that makes some logical sense. We would look at that and we would go, yeah, if I eat a whole bunch of processed foods, the things that I would assume, corn syrups and high fructose corn syrups, things that I could imagine would cause me cancer, then it would make sense that I would have more risk of cancer. But if I don't, then everything's healthy. Okay, let's bring up some data. This is a busy diagram, but here we have the same countries. On the left, percentage of deaths from heart disease and cancer, percentage of calories from unrefined plant foods, life ex expectancy compared to the average. And then the last column is the number of cigarettes per person per year compared to the average. Why? Because maybe it isn't just plant foods that contribute to this. Well, look at Hungary. Hungary gets as the highest heart disease and cancer, according to this, they eat the least unrefined plant foods. The life expectancy is about average, slightly below average, but basically average. But they actually smoke 134% the average of cigarettes. Right? But look at somebody like, like Sweden here. Sweden smokes a lot, le uh, a lot less than the average but they still have such a high risk of heart disease and cancer. Doesn't smoking then have an influence on your heart disease and cancer risk? So if I smoke more, I should expect to get a higher cancer risk. If I smoke less, I should expect to get less. Is it just the unrefined plant foods or might there be multiple things that contribute to whether you develop heart disease and cancer? Consider Greece. Greece, 35% of the deaths are attributed to heart disease and cancer. They get about a third of all of their calories from unrefined plant foods. Their life expectancy is slightly higher than normal, but they smoke 249% of the average. So another uh, person, the average, say, smokes one cigarette per person uh, per day. They smoke two and a half, right? So they smoke two and a half times, but yet their heart disease and cancer risk is low. Do you see where I'm dealing with here? You would think that that cigarettes would have a profound influence on the heart disease and cancer risk, but something else has to go in. Well, is it their unrefined plant foods? Well, not necessarily. Korea, they have a tremendously high, 143% smoking, right? But they have a tremendously low cancer risk. So we can't just do a one-to-one -one relationship. There has to be something else going on here. It can't just be the unrefined plant foods. It can't just be the cigarettes multiple factors. And that's why it is so easy if we just cherry pick our data and present it graphically, then we have a problem. And in the modern age of misinformation, we can then vomit out very easy graphs and we can look at them and go, ooh. And if we look at that, think about how they colored the graph in the top. Red, bad, green, good, green, plants, green, natural, red, angry, war, violence, shore, love, passion, inflamed, etc. But we get the idea of blood, heart, anger, green, plant, good. So now we do that, let's tie it into the climate change discussion.
I saw this poking around on the uh, internet for a while, and this is an incredibly busy diagram. If you are going to show information, do not vomit it out like this, because there's so much going on here that it is insane. So we have a title, Global Temperatures from 2500 BC to 2007 AD. In the lower left-hand corner, we have a description of it. Whenever solar radiation has decreased and volcanic activity has increased, global temperatures suddenly plummet often within weeks or months. What are they suggesting? Solar radiation has decreased and volcanic activity has increased, global temperatures suddenly plummet. So what are they saying? Our temperatures are associated with changes in the sun and volcanic eruptions. And so what do we get on this busy diagram? Well, we get labels. Warm is this sort of orangish red color, cold is the blue color. If we take it to its end, we have the normal temperature, however they define normal, as 57 degrees Fahrenheit. So then here's where the temperature of the world on average has been above 57, according to them, and below, and above, and below, and above, and below, etc. And then at the very end here, we have this abrupt above, this abrupt below, and this abrupt above now, and now we're sitting at 40, 58 degrees, so one degree temperature change. We have on here a bunch of dots to represent time. We have on here scattered volcanic eruptions. We have on here random things like the Hebrews exodus from Egypt, Vesuvius erupts, the birth of Christ, etc. So if we're just talking about solar radiation and volcanic activity, then random historical events on here seems strange to add on to an already busy diagram. For example, Jamestown founded in southeastern Virginia. Oh, wait, Jamestown, they died of what a bad winter, I guess we'll stick that down here. Then they have in the upper right-hand corner, Mount Pinatubo eruption. They're defining specifically one, we talked about that in the volcano lecture, uh, uh, the specific lecture I gave on volcanoes. If you're interested, go watch that. I, I really enjoyed that one. Mount Pinatubo eruption, 1.1 degree Fahrenheit rapid cool down from June 1991 to March 1992, global temperatures went from 0.6 degrees above normal to 0.5 degrees below normal. So now we have to look at what normal is. We have this 57 degrees, 58 degrees. So what we had is we had a massive decrease in temperature, and then we had a massive increase again. So they went to 0.5 degrees below normal, right? So that would have to be what this is right here, because that's what they're showing. But look at what they call the Little Ice Age, way down here, 56.3 degrees Fahrenheit. If this is a half degree below normal, this would be 56.5 degrees, which means 57, 56.5 degrees, 56.3 degrees. So this is a 0.7 degree change. According to this, this is a 0.6 degree change so what am I even looking at? We have axes that are all over, and the only two labeled temperatures, the only three, are this, this, and this. So this is one degree, this is 0.7 degrees, this is 0.5 degrees, this is point, the numbers don't make any sense. So why even put out something like this? Warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool. Temperature changes throughout history. Therefore, the problems that we are seeing are not people related, they are sun related, volcano related, clearly. And that when we add some amazing things, the dark ages, bad, right? The little ice age, cold, Jamestown dying in Virginia, Roman Empire, good, Hebrews, good, right? Vikings reach Canada, good. So why do I even made, uh, mention this? One last thing, at least 75 major temperature swings in the last 4,500 years. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I don't see 45 on here, but if they mean smaller ones, they're only showing like five major uh, temperature increases and five major temperature decreases. Chart prepared by climatologist Cliff Harris and meteorologist Randy Mann. So, why do I even bring this up? Why this graph? What's wrong with this image? Well, there are a lot of things that are wrong with this image, but they played around with the axes. Like we saw with the kindred workers, they played around with the axes. This is, they chose colors, warm, good, cold, blue, cold, right? And then they put on their names 
so that we look at it, we go, well, this was put out by a climatologist and a meteorologist. One's climate, one's weather. Those are both scientists. If you watch in the last, I don't know, since I've been alive, in the last 40 years, right? If you watch when we uh, interview people for documentaries, if we interview people for the news, we tend to put up what their position is, which makes sense. This is a doctor, this is a pharmacist, this is a policeman, whatever it is. In recent years, we've also started using the word author. We say, somebody's an author. There are lots of people that are authors. As I tell my students, I wrote a fan fiction about Forgotten Realms for all the D&D enthusiasts. I wrote a fan fiction. Technically, does that make me an author? It wasn't published, it was published on a fan fiction site. So we have to be careful about what we're presenting, how we're presenting it, and then what credentials we use for the people if we're trying to do that to go, I'm a person in a white lab coat, therefore I have attention. Ignore that for the moment. It can come back and be important. But if we are looking at their data and they use that and we go, oh, they obviously are smart people. No, we're going to look at it and go, they're lying about something, right? It is too easy to use position, color, uh, presentation, et cetera, to convince people of a particular idea or paradigm when if we would just take some moments to step back and sit and go, what am I looking at? We'd be able to sort through that chaff. Unfortunately, we live in an incredibly fast paced uh, information dense world. So it's many times difficult to actually vet that information. And that has helped climate change be as convoluted, as polarizing, and as politicized as it is. Crazy. 0.7 degrees, and yet it's this huge blip. It makes it seem like we should all freeze to death. Sure, little ice age, we should have all died, right? And if we do this, if climate change, if um, notice on here, there's no solar radiation actual mentions on here, but volcanic eruptions are shown to be there when temperature is decreasing, when temperature is increasing, when temperature is increasing, when, why don't we see more, more blips? Anyway, belaboring the point. So let's get into talking about politics. So when we talk about politics, I'm not trying to sway you in any particular viewpoint. I'm trying to present the information. This isn't lighthearted, but one of my favorite comments about this debate or any other comes actually from the TV show Babylon 5. Bruce Boxleitner's character is Captain Sheridan, says this, knowledge is a three-edged sword, your side, their side, and the truth. And we have to keep that in the back of our heads as we go through this. Right? Somewhere along the way, we got into an us versus them mentality, a believers versus deniers mentality, which is dangerous because believers suggest that it is a matter of faith and deniers suggest that it is a matter of abject or object truth. So that we see, we're looking at it, we go, it's blue, it's not blue. I'm going to, the, 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 it's not blue, the gosh darn plant pet isn't blue, right? We then tied it to a particular ideology or po particular political framework. There ten tends to be a, te there tends to be uh, a, an alignment between modern liberalism and the prospect that we need to enact change to combat climate effects, the drastic climate effects and the conservative mindset, which suggests more that business will solve everything, business as usual. Sort of a more socialist or communist, the way it is portrayed versus a capitalist idea that business will solve it because business will be the savior of mankind versus trying to just enact a draconian measures. Regardless of whether that is fair or not, we have developed an us versus them mentality it has, I've heard people use the idea of believers versus deniers, and that's wrong, we shouldn't do that. Uh, excuse me, and then tying it to political parties or political movements or political ideologies, that's not good. Because then, if it's tied to a particular idea, then there is a uh, discounting out of course. We go, oh, it's the other side, I'm not going to listen to them. It's all socialism. Wait a minute, no, no, no. Or it's just all business. One of the uh, more recent examples actually happened in the um, uh, remake of the Lorax. What we had is the idea that business had created a whole bunch of plastic, everything, everything was plastic and manufactured, etc. No one could go outside the cities. 
somebody goes outside the city, sees real plans, doesn't understand what they are, brings one back, it threatens to derail the entire capitalist model, spoiler alert, right? And then they grow an actual real life plant in the middle of this entire manufactured city. And the snidely whiplash mustache twirling villain comes in and basically says that that plant needs to die to keep the illusion that everybody's happy because we don't want them going back to the organic sort of natural model. And he has the most egregious, let it die, let it die, let it shrivel up and die. And I'm like, is, is that how one side looks at the other and sees sort of capitalism run rampant? And then when I see the other side, anybody who mentions something about climate change is immediately labeled as a liberal or a communist or a socialist. My wife and I worked with the, the city on a green initiative. Uh, the, the city specifically, the city wanted a long-term 15 year plan. And as part of that, it had talked about uh, bike lanes and trails and the urban canopy and uh, the who we were trying to uh, encouraged to come here, whether we were trying to build multi-family uh, uh, apartment complexes and encourage more of that, and how we were dealing with things like uh, water, because the, one of the city's biggest expenses is water infrastructure, getting water to a very disparate and spread out population. This is why we have to build new water towers to keep the pressure up, etc. And so we worked for, I don't know, it was like nine months on developing a plan off and on, trying to uh, come together and brainstorm. Do we want bike lanes? Do we want full bike lanes and some that are just mixed use and whatever? And when it was presented to the city council, a group came out of uh, another city and got their time in front of the city council and wrote up this incredibly long ranting document that seemed like they couldn't have just done it just for us. It seems like they do this in other places. And what I've been able to dig and gather, uh, they've been able to do this in other places, but it labeled us as communists and socialists in the same document. I'm like, those are different. And they said, multifamily homes, oh, that's just code for denying people the right to the American dream and keeping them from buying their own home and forcing collectivist models on people. And oh, bike lanes, that's denying people from their ability to drive a car and we're gonna force everybody to ride bikes and uh, it'll just destroy the economy. And the city largely went, yeah, okay, whatever. And they threw out a lot of what had been done. And it was one of those things that was like, how dare we actually have some sort of rational, uh, the other thing was public transportation. Can we get better public transportation? Oh no, you can't do that. Oh, you're denying people the right to, I'm like, if an object, if an idea is intelligent, if it makes logical business sense and people from all over have gathered together to try and do it, then your squat, your attempt to squash it isn't because you have a better idea. It's because you just don't like that idea. And this is what a lot of the debate has happened. This sort of rancorous, I can't, I won't even like, like children, like sticking our fingers in our ears and shouting, nah, 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 can't hear you. Right? So, Let's dive into it. Where did politicization and the debate begin? Well, this has been going on for a while. This isn't the first case, but it's one that received national and international attention. Rachel Carson was a biology, a biologist, environmentalist, and she wrote a book called The Silent Spring. And in that book, she suggested that the pesticides we were using at the time had, were affecting ecosystems in ways that were outside of their stated goal. We wanted to get rid of mosquitoes, we applied pesticides to them, but those pesticides got into a water supply, were uptaken by fish, people ingested those, they could die. But they got uptaken by fish, other things ate them and they died. For example, we have lead, uh, lead in the water, mercury in the water, uh, bald eagles ended up eating fish that had been contaminated, their shells got weak, the bald eagle shells broke when they attempted to sit on them, bald eagle populations came down. So we have the intended use of pesticides to treat one problem had a long-term influence on our environment and it could destabilize whole ecosystems on which we depend. We need to think about what we are doing before we just sort of uh, wantonly apply something because even if it seems like it makes sense at the time, long-term, we need to think long-term, it might be bad. She said, what's more, 
we can end up killing things that only provide us an emotional benefit, but which we depend on at least for sanity and stability. We all love lions. The Lion King was a great movie, even if it didn't relate to reality, but we all like lions. We like tigers and bears. Oh my, and we might end up killing them off. The suggestion was that if we were not able to rein in our pesticide use and think about how it was applied, try and maybe change the formulation, try and change its broad applicability rather than the carpet spray we do targeted spraying, etc. that if we do not curb our rampant use of that, we may wind up in a situation where we have, as she called it, a silent spring. The bugs are dead, the birds are dead, everything on them which depends is dead. The problem that she ran into was this. When she presented her idea, it was met with reasonable acceptance. Ooh. But to go after specific pesticides because of their seemingly egregiously harmful effects on the environment, that affected businesses. And the businesses started then pushing back. How much do we stop? What if it's our business and somebody else's business? That's going to cause a loss of income, a loss of revenue, a loss of jobs. Uh, where is your evidence? And she ran into a very interesting problem. She had suggested evidence of a particular outcome, but she didn't have conclusive objective evidence for long term. And the reason why she didn't have all that evidence is because it is really difficult to get long term evidence. Because how long do we wait to see the effects? For example, we have a drug on the market. The drug has been on the market for 40 years. In that 40 year time span, we have now figured out who it will affect, who it won't affect, the limitations that affect, what can be done to mitigate it, et cetera. We have a long-term view of that. Let's say a new drug comes out on the market. The company has just spent millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars building it. They want the drug on the market immediately. But what are the long-term effects, the unintended side effects, the interactions with other drugs, since there are a myriad of drugs out there? What do we do? Do we wait? My dad takes a blood thinner. The blood thinner he takes has been around for 40 years. A new blood thinner came out, and of course, a commercial came out on the news that said, ask your doctor if this blood thinner is right for you. And the blood thinner my dad takes, he has to go into the hospital one to two times a week to get his blood levels checked for his clotting factor, his INRs, as they call it, right? And that's annoying. But this new one said, oh, you don't need to do any of those. You don't need to go and get your fingers pricked all the time. You don't need to go to the doctor. And they said, ask your doctor. So I asked my dad whether he had talked about it with his doctor. And his doctor said, this drug that you've been taking has been out for four years. We know all of its problems. You take a new one, there might be unintended side effects. Wait until a bunch of people die. Wait until, and this is very dark, wait until all the lawsuits happen. In 10 years, we'll talk. Well, within five years, they've been pulled off the market because it had caused a whole bunch of unintended side effects. And now I see commercials for class action lawsuits for that exact drug. So the problem that we have is sometimes suggested evidence of a particular outcome exists. We look at it and we go, all of the evidence points to that, but it isn't conclusive. Smoking is a good example. We all have an idea that smoking is hazardous for our health. Now, smoking a cigarette, not a problem. Smoking a cigarette every day, maybe not a problem. Smoking more, maybe is a problem. But we have to think of long term, and it doesn't work the same way with everybody. I have friends that smoke, and they make jokes. This is my smoker's cough. Or when they got coronavirus, or somebody got they said, I knew that it was not like my normal smoker's cough, as in we know that it could be harmful to us. But the smoking industry has dragged their feet for years to admit. And then we have the plain packaging in some countries. We have also the Surgeon General's warning. They resisted that being put on there because they say there is no proof that cigarettes cause lung cancer, for example. Why? Because the timing of that effect may be 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and we have to follow one person and then many people, and then select out what other factors may have contributed, be able to discard those, and then say, yes, it was the smoking. And then we all have anecdotal evidence. I had a grandmother that lived into her 80s. She smoked since she was 14. And as she couldn't afford it in her later life, she would roll her own out of the most ungodly cigarettes imaginable, a lot of the most ungodly tobacco. 
And it was awful. As I made the joke, you'd walk into her house and you had to bring a knife to cut a breathable cube of air. You just sort of, <gasps> and leave it like the walls were yellow. And I love my grandmother, but she smoked and she had that ungodly cough, right? But she lived to be in her 80s. And then we had people that die younger. And we go, oh, was it the cigarettes? The tendency, the suggested evidence is there. So how does this apply to our politicization? Well, because science has errors associated with it, our machines that we use to measure radioactive decay or to measure the levels of my dad's blood, et cetera, all have tolerances, all have ranges of error. The data that we have, we might not be able to do a study that involves 100 million people. We might only be able to do small studies. We try and make the population representative enough, but there are still limits. We don't want something small. I saw a drug company that was, I think it was Lunesta or one of them. It said, it is unsure how this drug works. And then it said, the voiceover said, it is thought that this drug does something. And then at the bottom, it said, rigorously tested on a nationwide population of 26 people. Like that's a family reunion. That's not exactly representative. So we want to get better data, but there's a limitation to how much we can obtain. There's a limitation to the accuracy of our machines. There are so many other factors, et cetera. So what we do is we go, this is the best statement that we can make about the data that we have. But because in many cases we can't make a conclusive statement, then it's something that people can pick apart, right? Busy slide. Here's a uh, very nice bearded man on the right. This is George Perkins Marsh, who was as our ambassador to Turkey in the 1860s. And he wrote a book, I think it was called Man and Nature. Uh, he wrote a book in the late 1800s about his understanding of the environment and man's influence on the environment. And here is one small snippet from it. The geological, hydrographical, and topological surveys, which almost every general and even local government of the civilized world is carrying on, are making yet more important contributions to a stock of geographical and general physical knowledge. And within a comparative short space, there will be an accumulation of well-established constant and historical facts from which we can safely reason upon all the relations of actions and reaction between man and external nature. What does he say? We're able to gather at the time, even in the 1860s, still carrying through 160 years later, we were gathering so much data, he believed that we could safely reason upon all the relations of action and reaction between man and external nature. That is extreme optimism. But we are, even now, breaking up the floor and wainscoting and doors and window frames of our dwelling for fuel to warm our bodies and seethe our pottage, and the world cannot afford to wait till the slow and sure progress of exact science has taught it a better economy. I'll finish this here in a moment, but he had, as ambassador to Turkey, and was able to tour Asia Minor, parts of Europe, mainland Europe, and he said, there are certain sections where they have removed so much forest in the pursuit of building homes and burning for wood, et cetera, that they're as devoid as the service of the moon. Exaggeration, of course, but those were his words. And he said, we cannot yet know what the effects of those are. Because of the accumulated data, we can reason, we can safely reason upon all the relations of action and reaction between man and external nature. We would be able to figure that out but we cannot know that at the time. But his next statement there, we are even now breaking up the floor and wainscoting and doors and window flames of our dwelling. He wasn't talking about the physical dwelling, but the external natural dwelling for fuel to warm our bodies and seethe our pottage, cook our food, and the world cannot afford to wait till the slow and sure progress of exact science has taught it a better economy. His statement was, we are seeing the effects now, and we need to judge them and act on them now, even if we do not have 100% certainty, because if we do that, if we wait, it might be too late. His last statement here is amazing. Many practical lessons have been learned by the common observation of unschooled men, and the teaching of simple experience on topics where natural philosophy is scarcely yet spoken are not to be despised. I love this. Many practical lessons have been learned by the common observation of unschooled men. You don't have to be a scientist to know that there's a problem. In London, through the 1950s, the air was so bad that it caused a, a generation of people to have a much higher incidence of rickets where they weren't getting enough vitamins and their legs would be bowed and their bones malformed. In the, the 1940s in America, 
in Pennsylvania, near where I grew up, we had the town of Denora. Denora had three steel and zinc works in town. It sat, like in western Pennsylvania, in valleys. And the pollution that they were spewing out, the, the chemicals that were spewing out of the smokestacks, couldn't easily make it out of the valleys. So a weather system came in where uh, sort of a higher pressure came in and blanketed like a roof on the valley and kept that smoke close to the ground. At noon on a day, on one of the days in the town, they actually had to turn on the streetlights because they couldn't really see the sun. And 3,000 of the town's 12,000 inhabitants got sick. And half of their livestock in the valley got sick. And luckily, the weather patterns changed and blew all that bad air out somewhere else over the, within three days because they surmised that had it lasted for another two or three days, one third to one quarter of the town's population, or a quarter to a third of the town's population would have died. And that inspired us to go, you know what, maybe we need uh, regulations to clean up our air. Many practical lessons have been learned by common uh, observation of unschooled men, and the teaching of simple experience should not be despised. I love this man, All right? More modern example. In 2004, a very polarizing figure named Naomi Oreskes, uh, who is a uh, science historian, published an article called Science and Public Policy, What's Proof Got to Do With It? And her premise was this. Everybody, when we, when uh, politicians look to scientists and they say, okay, tell me what's going on here. We're trying to make public policy to enact some change. And we want, we want scientists to inform us so ostensibly we can inform the public. So the scientists do the research, they inform the politicians, politicians ostensibly make informed decisions that enact positive change for society. She said, the problem that we run into is this, many politicians demand proof and proof we might not be able to give them because how long do we wait to get exact proof? She uses as an example, plate tectonics. In 1910, Alfred Wegener proposed the idea that the continents drifted around the globe. He presented an incredible amount of evidence that we could not discount, even though the mechanism that he had, the tides of the moon, were insufficient to actually pull the continents. But over the next 50 years, we built up an incredible body of evidence, which led to us forming the theory of plate tectonics in 1960. The idea of the plate, the surface of the earth being broken up into pieces, moving rat, interacting, creating earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, mountain ranges, valleys, etc. And she said this, she said, we had the theory of plate tectonics and we could use that to build future studies from, but it wasn't until the 1980s that we actually had GPS units in various areas around the globe that could actually track plate movements. She said, we made an understanding in 1960 and it wasn't until 24 years later, I think 1984, that we had conclusive evidence from GPSs. She said, should we have waited? And even now, it is still just a theory. It is a much more refined theory, but there's still so many aspects of it that we are still debating. So at what point is proof sufficient? And she wrote this, this thought experiment, talking about plate tectonics, this thought experiment makes it clear that the appropriate standard for judging science is neither proof, nor certainty, nor unanimity, but a broad and firm consensus of relevant experts in the field. The reason is simply this, Scientific knowledge is the intellectual and social consensus of affiliated West uh, experts based on the weight of available empirical evidence and evaluated according to accepted methodologies. If we feel that a policy question deserves to be informed by scientific knowledge, then we have no choice but to ask, what is the consensus on experts on this matter? If there's no consensus of experts, as was the case among Earth scientists among moving continents through the late 1960s, then we have a case for more research. Now, her contention is this, the relevant experts in the field have come to a consensus and have said that climate change is largely attributable to the actions of man, and that therefore, man needs to take steps to avert its worst effects. Some people would debate that, lots of people would debate that. And one of the things that she mentions that I've seen debated is the word relevant experts, the words relevant experts. What makes a relevant expert? And I've heard people jump on a bandwagon of conspiracy theories that say, are they just suppressing people that have a differing view? And if they are suppressing those, should we listen to those other people? Again, this gets us into the us versus them, believers versus deniers. And we're gonna talk about that here in a little bit. But she said, proof isn't, uh, 
shouldn't be required, shouldn't be expected. It should be a broad consensus of the relevant experts in the field. Now, in this estimation, the observations of unschooled men could inform other people, but in her estimation, it should be the experts in the field discussing and certifying those, right? So is there a relevant uh, consensus of relevant experts in the field? Well, we're actually gonna come, and then we'll come back to that last one. We're gonna come to NASA and the consensus idea. NASA put out a statement. You can see this on NASA's website. If you type in NASA climate change, and especially if you want to get to it, type in 97%. NASA put out this study. Multiple studies published in peer-reviewed scientific journals show that 97% or more of actively publishing climate scientists agree. Climate warming trends uh, over the past century are extremely likely due to human activities. In addition, most of the leading scientific organizations worldwide have issued public statements endorsing this position. 97% or more of actively publishing climate scientists. That is a huge consensus. Now, they actually have this asterisk here. Technically, a consensus is a general agreement of opinion, but the scientific method steers us away from this as to an objective framework. In science, facts or observations are explained by a hypothesis, a statement of a possible explanation for some a natural phenomenon, which can then be tested and retested until it is refuted or disproved. Why do they feel the need to do that? Because this is odd. Science should be about presenting information. And then politicians can digest that information. But because of the weird attempt, because of the challenges to it, because of the misinformation, because of grass, et cetera, because of people going, I champion this person, and I champion this person, and this person says no, and this is a scientist, why aren't you listening to him? This is one of the first times that I've ever seen, maybe the only time I've ever seen, a scientific problem that needed to be certified as if we sort of like lump the weight of our body into it and go, because we're experts, you should listen to us. I've never seen that before, which shows how politicized this has become. So, last statement, as scientists gather more observations, all on NASA's website, as NASA's scientists gather more observations, they will build up one ex uh, explanation and add details to complete the picture. Eventually, a group of hypotheses might be integrated and generalized into a scientific theory, a scientifically acceptable general principle or body of principles offered to explain phenomena. What they are trying to do is explain on their own website what a hypothesis is, what a theory is, but it's weird that we now have to come across and say almost as a mission statement that we, for example, the American Association of Petroleum Geologists or the Geological Society of America or the US Geological Survey, we have to come along and certify it almost like uh, a church coming up with a mission statement and go, we believe X, Y, and Z. And that is odd. The fact that that has come up says that there has had to have been a transition from what we historically accepted as a, uh, the way we develop a theory, and then how we have to defend this theory, not amongst our peers, but amongst scientists, or at least a large group of scientists and society. So how does this happen? Well, let's come back to a man named Stephen Schneider. Stephen Schneider uh, received an incredible amount of attention in the late 90s, and has been still receiving an incredible amount of attention over the last 20 years because of a quote that he made that has been off taken out of context or has been cherry picked. We pick certain portions of it. And this shows the problem that scientists have had to find themselves coming into conflict with when we are discussing something like climate change in the public space. Quote, on the one hand, as scientists, we are ethically bound to the scientific method, in effect, promising to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but, which means that we must include all doubts the caveats, the ifs, ands, and buts. On the other hand, we are not just scientists, but human beings as well. And like most people, we like to see the world a better place, which in this context translates into our working to reduce the uh, risk of potentially disastrous climate change. To do that, we need to get broad-based support to capture the public's imagination. That, of course, get, means getting loads of media coverage. So we have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified dramatic statements, and make little mention of any doubts we might have. 
This double ethical bind we frequently find ourselves in cannot be solved by any formula. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest, and I hope it means doing both. I hope it means being both. You can imagine why that comment received an incredible amount of attention, because it suggests that scientists were trying to obscure facts, figures, trying to downplay their doubts, etc. But what he said in that first portion, he's acknowledging the limitations of science. We have limits. Whenever you see something, this thing was radiometrically dated or carbon dated to a 1400 years plus or minus 30 years. That plus or minus 30 years or whatever is because of the errors inherent with the machine, the sampling techniques, etc. We cannot erase all those. If you've ever taken a science class, chemistry, biology, physics, then we have to understand the limitations in the measurements we make in the lab. We have to understand the limitations, the sensitivity of our machines, etc. So we have to, as scientists, record those. I remember one of my earliest times in a science class when I realized that I'd done the, the uh, experiment incorrectly and my results weren't valid because I'd screwed it up. I sort of went, and I, I, I had that moment. And the teachers knew that we were going to do that because they knew, and that's why they used it as a teaching moment. Yeah, we know that you fudged the information because you wanted to get the expected result. So they said, don't do that. A good scientist keeps on and goes, well, I screwed up. Now what do I do? And so he's acknowledging that. He says, we have to acknowledge that, that that's what we have to do as scientists. But now we run into the very interesting scenario. Let's say as scientists, we come across an alarming idea that, let's assume in this case, that we, we can come across the alarming idea that the planet is warming up. And there seems to be connections between what we are doing and what we as people are doing, driving cars, et cetera, that pollute and the temperature change to the planet. How do we stop that? Do we not? Are we just, just the facts, ma'am? And so we just repeat that? Or are we also people? This is the same kind of problems that you'll see uh, teachers and uh, polit uh, police officers and other getting in problems with advocacy. Because at one respect, they are either a public servant or a private employee, but they have that, we're tied to a company, we're tied to a government, we're tied to an agency, and then we're also people. I am a voter and a teacher. My te as a teacher, I have to be as objective as possible. As a voter, I should be objective as possible, but I have to come up with a value judgment and go, this I think will better align with my values, so I'm going to vote in this way, so I have to make a choice. I still should consider everything objectively, but at the end of the day, I have to choose either A or B, or A, B, or C, or however many things are on the ballot. And so what he's saying here is this, if we do that, if we go out and we present it in the public space, then it's, a, it's immediately able to be attacked. Well, well, what about the doubts? So do we cover the doubts? Are we, under, are we sure that when we cover that information, it will be faithfully represented? We're not talking fake news. We're just talking a new cycle. It is easy to misconstrue something. We know this if you've ever texted somebody and you went, oh God, that sounded worse than the way I thought it did because we lose the emotion. We can't, nobody can see us. And then when we get on the media, are we attempting to grandstand and should we do that as scientists? One of my favorite examples of this is actually from plate tectonics. I don't know how many times I've had people come up to ask me when, not if, when is California going to fall off into the ocean? When? When is it? Like you want it to happen? Number two, it's not going to fall off into the ocean. Number two, it's not all of California. What they're talking about is the San Andreas Fault in southwestern California and that the sliver of California and the Baja Peninsula uh, to the southwest is actually on the Pacific plate and everything else in California and the rest of North America is on the North American plate. And they're sliding side by side, right? So we have a section of California which is sliding relative to the rest. And there's a possibility that that northern end could become a peninsula, detach, and potentially become a linear island. It is a possibility. Unlikely, but it could. So where did that idea come from? In the burgeoning idea of the 1960s plate tectonics, as we were debating it, and it became its own rancorous debate as 
departments, geology departments would, we don't believe plate tectonics, yes we do, and they would fight, and there would be even inter interdepartmental fighting or intra-departmental fighting. People would get fired, people would transfer, they'd be like, I don't like this hostile department, I have to go where other people listen to plate tectonics. Um, and I would imagine they probably argued like belief, belief versus denial, and we shouldn't because that's faith-based, we shouldn't do that. Uh, but I would imagine in that time span from the 1960s into the 1970s, it was getting digested very rancorously in science departments, but it was also making its way into the public consciousness. And one of the best examples of this is the first Superman movie with Christopher Reeve. In that, Lex Luthor had a plan to detonate nuclear weapons along the San Andreas Fault, and his visual was to show that if he did that, it would forcibly break California, southwestern California, off into the ocean. He bought him a bunch of deserts, so now he had beachfront property. So because, that, because this was already kicking around in the public consciousness, and because that movie was so popular, now, even 50 years later, 45 years later, people ask me, so when's California going to fall off into the ocean? Think about how tying those together misconstrued something. Did people do it intentionally? I don't think they did. But when we only have time to half listen anyway, right, and we don't have time to investigate fully, it's easy for things to get lodged in there that we shouldn't. And so as scientists, if we go, if we express our doubts, then people go, well, then I don't need to do anything, right? So here he presented a very honest approach for how scientists have to, to live their lives, right? When it comes to a uh, public debate like this and particular outcomes, and people immediately said, well, now you're just trying to hide the story, right? So if we talk about climate change, man caused climate change, okay? What we would call anthropogenic climate change, climate change caused by people. It has been debated for over a century. Actually, its roots go back into the late 1800s, really. However, in recent years, it's been heavily debated, and it comes down to a bunch of questions, some of which we've addressed, some of which we will. Is it man or nature? Very simply, is, are people doing it, or is it natural? Or, your side, their side, and the truth, is it a third, is it some of both? Well, climate change is cyclical without people, so why is this not just another cycle? We talked about that. The sun affects the earth more than we do. We talked about that. Plants love carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide, more plants. We talked about that up to a point. Longer growing seasons are a good thing, sort of, but some plants need the cool down period. More people die in colder weather than warmer weather. That's true. But if we get a heat wave in areas that we're not expecting it, remember France a couple of years ago, then it is tremendously bad. Fossil fuels bring economic benefits. That's true. And if we change away from them, there would have to be a fundamental restructuring of society. And that is scary. That goes back to the fear. Right? So we have a whole bunch of questions that we have to ask here. The problem with it is, is because of the questions, because the debate can spin off into the weeds like, like link hopping, then we have a tendency to see people make sweeping generalizations. And I'm going, you're going to hear me going to say, I'm going, you're going to hear me say, sure, you're going to hear me say sides, both sides of the debate. But the debate has more than two sides, but we tend to see it as an us versus them. So I'm going to talk about it as a binary, and then we're going to look at the, uh, the difference later on. As the debate grew more vehement, people started to become really entrenched in their viewpoints. And so then it became, yes, it is. No, it isn't. Two of the most egregious examples of this happened because of language. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the IPCC, is the UN Working Group on Climate Change, which was to bring together professionals from a bunch of different nations to all put their collective heads together to make a statement, look at the available data, create a report so that the UN can use it as a way of discussing worldwide projects to, uh, to deal with climate change, affect climate change, not or whatnot. They used this word. They said, we are getting to a point where climate change will cause irreversible damage. Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, said that if we do not phase out fossil fuels by the end of this century, we will have irreversible damage to the planet. Irreversible is a dangerous word, because irreversible says never, can't be changed, this is the way it is, there's no way to flip it back. What would that be? I take a pencil, I snap that pencil, 
there's no way for me to put it back on. Sure, I can glue it, but it won't be as strong, right? And then we go, but if you can glue it, see, if I could put it back together, it might not be as good, but I could still put the pencil back together. Irreversible means I couldn't do that. It just wouldn't, wouldn't fit. No matter what I glued or did, it wouldn't work. We go, wait a minute. Dinosaurs died out. They died, right? But other species lived on. That asteroid didn't cause irreversible damage to the planet. What did it do? It made it too difficult for the dinosaurs to survive, and so they died out, and mammals then took over, right? Are we talking about irreversible damage to the planet, or are we saying, are they suggesting that it could cause so much damage that it could kill us off? In other words, are we the animal that fouls its own nest, and then it ends up adversely affecting us? When you use the term irreversible, though, people go, the planet has seen worse before asteroids, plagues of madness. So immediately people uh, attacked that word and said, this is ludicrous. Planet has had, had worse, therefore we can then discount everything else you say. Why did they use the term irreversible? I think because of what was said from Dr. Snyder earlier, they wanted to make a statement that if we make it bad and now they had all of their doubts in this incredibly dense document you could have read but they put together basically a working statement at the beginning as a summary people looked at that and went too long didn't read it irreversible damage was that a grandiose uh statement yeah and it caused people to go no nah, i don't want to listen to that bullshit essentially pardon the expression right but that's what they did Senator James Imhoff famously brought a snowball onto the floor of the Senate, and he said, shenanigans. What are shenanigans? They changed the word from global warming to climate change. They know it's not happening. Therefore, we can discount the entire thing. And he holds up the snowball, and he says, see, I went out and collected a snowball outside. The fact that it's still snowing outside, the fact that I could bring this in, obviously means the planet isn't heating up. So what do we have? Entrenched viewpoints, sweeping generalizations, which completely fuel partisan politics, but don't actually address the entire problem. So let's look at that one. Why climate change and not global warming? Global warming is the idea that the planet is heating up and is going to cause a whole bunch of unintended side effects, right? Uh, sea levels rising, uh, as we talked about them before, uh, insects changing their ranges, right? Desert-like conditions, wet-like conditions, doesn't matter, right? Diversity of things. But the term global warming, even though that's its, uh, its understood definition, the term global warming suggests by its very nature that every day is going to be hotter than the day before, Every month is going to be hotter than the month before. Every year, every decade, every century is going to be hotter than the year before. And we will eventually just roast. Because if the globe is warming, that means it isn't cooling. So it's, we're just seeing a constant temperature increase. That isn't what's implied by it. That's not the actual definition, but that's the way people look at it and they go, oh, planet is heating up. Well, when you can pull out a snowball, then obviously it hasn't heated up to the point where that is melted yet. So it made a case. Climate change is a more fair term. The climate changes. It's harder to argue against because the climate does change and that this is just anthropogenic man-caused climate change. So we changed it to be more fair and to avoid the unintended view that people had about the words global warming but by the act of changing it to make it more scientifically accurate and more fair, then immediately it looks like we're trying to cover something up. Now, the funny thing is, my grandmother, my grandmother just recently passed away, but she was in her 90s, and she made the statement that the weathers in Pennsylvania, the weathers, the climate in Pennsylvania is not like it used to be when she was a kid. That's a momentous statement because she would have been, let's see, 100 and, 100 and she, would, she was in her 90s, so she was born in the 20s, right? And that is momentous for her to make that. Why? Because she's now had almost 100 years of viewing, and she was able to see from her childhood till present that climate is changing. So climate change makes sense as a, as a statement, 
But changing the name from global warming to climate change made it seem like scientists were attempting to hide something. Now, there's another way of looking at it. And this is the reason why I have this picture here. Let's say the average temperature of the planet is 60 degrees, okay? Let's say the average human body temperature, which is a much more accurate measurement, 98.6 degrees, right? There are a lot fewer things going in to coming out with that average. So when we go from 98.6 degrees to 100 degrees, we said to have a fever and the manifestation of that are sweats and chills. It's not just all sweating or all chills, it's a, an oscillation. It is a uh, decrease in homeostasis which causes everything to flick back and forth. So if we have climate, a global warming and it, the suggestion is that it's just increasing at all times, and therefore it should suggest that we just, oh, it's always getting hotter. No, it's just making everything more extreme. And that's the idea behind either global warming and climate change, but we sort of took one of the uh, stated names, global warming, we changed it to a more fair and scientifically accurate comment on climate change, and we still got in trouble. So that's where that comes in, sweeping generalizations. So let's talk about coronavirus, because there's an analogy here. Measuring the impacts of a evolving problem. If you watch from the very beginning, we didn't, we didn't necessarily think it was going to be as bad as it got. There were several uh, statements came out and said it's not going to be as bad as we got, even from the scientists. There was a reason that the initial mask orders weren't pushed out because we needed those for the emergency responders. There was then a change because we needed to have masks, once we realized the efficacy of having masks to block uh, aerosols coming out of your body, right? We started seeing this change in real time. But even though we saw it change in real time, people can go back to the beginning and go, but you said this then, and this was said now. Then we go, okay, it's an evolving crisis. Sure. Well, I'm healthy. I have no outward symptoms. Iceland did an analysis of their own and found that 50% of all of the people that they tested were asymptomatic. There were no external symptoms, but they could be spreaders like typhoid Mary going around to other people. Then we can see something like this. Is coronavirus airborne? Well, it depends on what you mean by airborne. What's the scientific definition of airborne? And I've seen debates about masks don't stop the virus. That is absolutely the case. Masks do not stop the virus coming out, but they do stop uh, globules, spittle that comes out of your body, right? That can contain viruses. So if I just have a mask up and I take a virion and I put it in the mask, it'll come out the other side because for most masks, the spacing of the, the lattice that holds the mask together, the netting that holds it together is too big and the virus will pass through. The really good masks are in limited supply. There the spacing is smaller and the virus can't pass through. So that is true, the virus can make it through and that is an airborne idea. But the virus load, how many individual virions you get is seems to be related to your likely risk of manifest, uh, manifest, manifesting problems. So what does airborne really mean? If we're just talking about individual loose virions, no, the masks don't work. But if we're talking about them as globules, they do to stop the spittle from you affecting somebody else. But we saw that in real time and we're seeing this how it's being picked apart. So we see then this, well, what should be done? Well, now we have economic, uh, the economy versus a shutdown of non-essential businesses. I've seen fights in my own community where the county says one thing, you, you won't shut down businesses. The local mayors say other things. Then the state gets involved and says, you won't do this. And yes, you will. And you won't do this. We are debating in real time about an evolving scientific societal problem. Do we wait until we know everything about coronavirus before we act? Or do we take reasonable action now? Now, the question is, what's reasonable action? This cost us too much money. We did this and it didn't work, but we didn't know it wasn't going to work. Well, then we should have waited to know whether we should have spent that money, right? And now we come back to George Perkins Marsh. We cannot wait for the short progress of exact science to teach the world a better economy. Do we wait and then act or is waiting too late? right? To quote Creedence Clearwater Revival, does someday never actually come? And now we're seeing this. That's the reason why I bring up coronavirus. So let's talk about the effects of politicization. 
the arguments are ultimately self-reinforcing. They galvanize people. Now it has become a cause. And this is where the words believers and deniers should never be used, but they are. Believers suggest that it is a matter of faith. Deniers suggest that they are looking at reality and ignoring it. They are seeing their own face in the mirror and they're ignoring it. And then what do we do? We then find somebody that supports our viewpoint and we then say, look, this person is saying that it isn't a thing. I've trotted out my own scientists. And the other side says, I've trotted out my own scientists. Fight, right? It's like a death battle. They're ultimately self-defeating because the genocide and generalizations can be easily discounted and then they're fodder for future attacks. I don't know what the answer is as to how to, to get rid of the politicization. I don't think we can, but we need as individuals to be able to be those unschooled men, as it were, because most of us are not climate scientists, the unschooled men to look at the data for ourselves because if it is so obvious then we should be able to consider the data, look and go, that person's lying to me. Why? Because they just, they're, they're, they're trying to convince me of something. And we should be able to use that knowledge to be able to make a judgment call on this. There's another problem that we run into here, which is big ideas. We're going to get into this more next time, but big ideas. The debate is framed as being, we all must get involved or nothing will change. That's also not true. That's one of those sweeping generalizations. Because when we do that, then we have the uh, easily discountable idea, which is this. You're telling me that if I throw out this aluminum can, suddenly I'm going to kill the planet. No. But if everybody throws out that can, right, then there could be a problem. And we have this idea, if the problem is so big, if it's so global, if we say it's a global problem that needs global solutions, we can't even agree in families on what we want to do for dinner, let alone countries agreeing on what to do, because they have all their own little interests. Even in America, we have 50 states, right? And a bunch of territories. And Washington, D.C., and they can't all agree. So when we do this, we have these big problems, and then they are politicized. It is no wonder that nothing gets done, regardless of what or what does not need to be done, right? So, this situation is complex. The politicization is understandable. I do not like it. I can understand how we got there, understandable in that way. I can understand how we got here uh, because of all of the different parties that are invested in this, from Rachel Carson's Silent Spring to the coronavirus analogy. We can see all of that happening, right? We need to avoid sweeping generalizations because they're ultimately self-defeating. We need to avoid using words like believers or deniers, because if we do that, then who's ever on the other side of the conversation immediately discounts everything we say, right? So where do we go from here? The last and final video next week in the climate change uh, discussion is going to be on changes that we can make, changes that are actually happening, cool changes, really cool science, a lot of pictures, a lot of cool uh, discussion, and some big questions, some open questions, some questions that I've gotten, uh, been challenged with over the years repeatedly. So we're going to talk about those open questions. I know this is a lot of text. I tried to keep it on the screen so that you could read, go back, read it. If you like this, uh, click the subscribe button, like this video, put some comments in if you have questions. If you want to debate with me, do it, because that's what I'm here. Brett Burkett, Black Land Geology and Reptiles, and I hope you had a great night, and I will see you next week.